Today I want us to look at a message that's called The Promise. And what we've talked about here in this whole series with Bringing Hope is, is really rooted in Acts 2.39 where it says this, this promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. I want us to, to pull back a little bit and look at, well, what is this promise and how do we get the benefits of this promise that God makes to us in this passage? In order to do that, we've got to go back to Acts chapter 2. If you've got your Bibles, you can be opening up there, your tablets or your smartphones, we can go there to Acts chapter 2. The scene is this. The apostles have been told by Jesus after his death, burial, and resurrection, he spent 40 days on the earth and he, he appeared to them and to others and, and he, he's proved that he had really conquered the grave. He gave them all the evidence that they needed. And then he told his disciples, wait in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. He said, then you're going to be my witnesses, beginning in Jerusalem, then to Judea, Samaria, to the rest of the world. So he said, here's what's going to happen. If you will wait until you get the power I'm going to give you, then you will start proclaiming this message of hope to the world that I have come to bring. And so the disciples were obedient, and they waited in Jerusalem. And it says in Acts 2, while they were there, that that the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. It was an amazing, miraculous phenomenon where it looked like tongues of fire that appeared over all of them, and they began to speak in other languages. Now, there's a lot of confusion about this that's really easy to clear up if you just actually read the Bible. If you just actually read what it says, it tells you what they were doing. It says, as they were speaking, the people heard them speaking the message in their own native languages. What we call tongue speaking today is not what they were doing in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, they were speaking known languages where the people could hear it and understand it and know exactly what was being said. Now, that was still no less a miracle because they didn't know these languages. It was by the power of the Holy Spirit that they were able to speak those languages. It's like if all of a sudden today I could preach in German. I don't know a lick of German, except from Hogan's Heroes. I learned a little bit there. Some of you don't even know what that is. It's an old, old show, right? So uh, that was the miracle is that all of a sudden they were empowered to speak in languages they had never studied. And the crowd, a crowd gathered and a crowd was amazed that these apostles were able to speak like that. Now there had been the sound like a mighty rushing wind that got their attention. And then the apostles speaking in these languages that got their attention. It was a feast going on in Jerusalem. So there were thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in Jerusalem at the time. So they are all gathering to see what is this phenomenon? What's going on? And it says that Peter stood up from among the others others and began to preach the main message that day on that day of Pentecost after the resurrection of Jesus you remember Jesus had made a promise to Peter after he made the good confession about who Jesus was that he was the Christ the son of the living God he says you're Peter and upon this rock of your confession I will build my church he told Peter I will give you the keys to the kingdom do you remember that so what do you do with keys you unlock doors and open them up Here's Peter, the main spokesperson on the day of Pentecost that day, preaching the very first gospel message ever preached, opening the door and welcoming people into the kingdom of God. Jesus was keeping his promise to Peter that Peter would be the one used to present that opening up of the door of the kingdom to the world. But I want us to look at, we have an amazing, an amazing gift from God in Scripture All of Scripture is a wonderful gift of God. It's God's love letter to us, God's message to us. And in Scripture that God has preserved for us, he he preserved for us a good part of this message that Peter preached that day. We have a record of it. We have recorded here that message that Peter was preaching that day, the first time the gospel was ever preached. So let's pick up with this message in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. And here's some of the uh, main part of what Peter was telling the people that day. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Sometimes I have to say that at Lakeshore too, all right? He had to get their attention, all right? They're still amazed with all that was going on. So he says, now listen up. Here we go. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. So Peter starts out with this. 
I want you to remember, because you were eyewitnesses to people in the crowd that day, some of them were right there when Jesus did the amazing miracles and wonders and signs that he had done while he was here. Think about all those things Jesus did. He gave sight to the blind. He was able to get, make the lame walk. He walked on the water. He calmed the storm. These people had been around for that. For all of those wonderful things, he had, risen, he, had, he had brought people back from the dead. They had been witnesses to these things. And he wants them to think back. Remember, you know what I'm talking about. You saw these things. You heard about these things. You had friends who were eyewitnesses to these things. You see, God never asked us to believe without evidence. He, he's provided all the evidence in the world for us to put our faith in Jesus. And so he's reminding them of all the evidence Jesus had already given them. That he was who he claimed to be. And then he goes on with the message in verse 23. This man who did all these great miracles, right? That God did through him. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. The message took a little turn here. I mean, they were excited about, yeah, think, think about all those great miracles. Wasn't that wonderful? And then the next thing he says is, yeah, but guess what you did? You took the one that God was doing those great miracles through and you, with the help of wicked men, he's talking about the Gentiles here, the Roman government, and the Roman military. You, with the help of wicked men, what did you do to this guy? You nailed him to a cross. But then he quickly adds in verse 24, but God. Now, anytime you hear the words, but God, you know something big is about to be turned around. All right, there, there's some big change about to happen here when it says, but God. But God, it says, raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Wow. Yeah, you, you did nail him to a cross, but God, God knew this in advance. Remember, he said this was God's deliberate plan by his foreknowledge. He knew this was going to happen. And he already laid out this plan that through that act, he was going to raise Jesus then from the dead to demonstrate that Jesus was not like any other teacher they had ever heard. That Jesus was not like any other philosopher that had ever spoken there in that region of the world or ever on the earth. That Jesus was set apart because Jesus demonstrated through the resurrection that death had no power over him. That death could not hold him. That the one enemy we all face that we don't have an answer for, Jesus has an answer for that. Jesus already answered that through his resurrection. He has proven that he is totally set apart from any other teacher of philosophy or religion that ever has been or ever will be. God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death. It was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And then he says in verse 36, Therefore, based on that evidence, based on that testimony, based on what you are eyewitnesses to, and you know this happened, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Now, Peter uses two distinct words here that are really important for that Jewish audience. They understood the word that is translated Lord to mean absolute supreme ruler over all. It's a term for God. All right? So he's saying, God has made this Jesus that you crucified the supreme ruler over everyone and everything. He is God. And he says, he's also made him Messiah. Now for the Jews, that was dear to their hearts. Messiah meant deliverer, anointed one, savior. And God has made this Jesus supreme ruler and savior both at the same time. The one that had been promised for ages. The one that had been spoken of from the beginning. The fulfillment of the hopes of the world. Is found in Jesus. Verse 37. It says when the people heard this. They were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles. Brothers. What shall we do? Cut to the heart is a good translation. Of, of the original there. 
We might use a term today in, in our language as they were convicted. They understood right away. Oh man, what have we done? This is the Messiah. This is the Son of God. And we, how did we treat him? We nailed him to a cross. We killed him. Now God raised him from the dead and now he's supreme ruler. And now we have to answer to him. And what have we done? We're guilty of nailing him to a cross. And now we have to answer to him. So the question they ask is the most important question in the history of the world. It's the most important question. And it's the first time it's ever been asked because it's the first time it's all come together. The whole gospel message is now complete through the death, burial, and resurrection. Now the work has been done. Now the offer can be made that could never have been made before this. Now redemption is available through Christ. And they want to know, we understand we messed up. What can we do about this? Is there any hope? That's the question. Is there any hope? When we understand that our sin put Jesus on that cross. That's a question every human being needs the answer for. Because what have we all done? We've all sinned. We are all just as guilty as the crowd there that day of taking Jesus and driving nails through his hands and his feet and crucifying him there on that cross. Our sins put him there too. So we need to ask the question today, is there any hope? What can we do now that we understand how badly we've messed up? And Peter's answer is the most important answer ever given in the history of the world. Peter's answer says, yes, there is hope. And here's how you can claim that hope. Okay? So, so this is important forever, for everyone, for all time. What did Peter say is the answer to the question, is there any hope? What can we do? Here's what Peter said. Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. What did he say it was for? The forgiveness of your sins. That's where the hope is. We know we've sinned. We know we put Jesus on that cross. The only thing that could give us hope is that there is a chance of forgiveness of sins. So he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now the Jews understood a lot about the Spirit of God. Even throughout the Old Testament, the Spirit of God is made known and, and this work is revealed. And what they understood about the Spirit of God is that that's the Spirit of life. It's the source of life. It gives life. It sustains life. The Spirit of God is life. Remember in the book of Genesis when it said he made man from the dirt and then he, he, he breathed into man the breath of life. The word used there in the Hebrew is the same word for spirit, the Spirit of God. It is the Spirit of God that gives life to things that are dead. That's where life comes from. So he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you. You can receive forgiveness of your sins. And as a gift from God, you can receive the Holy Spirit, the source and the sustainer of life can come and indwell you. That's eternal life. That's the hope of the world. That's my hope. That's your hope. Peter's answer is the most important answer ever given to the most important question ever asked. Is there hope? When we've sinned, and we've all sinned, so we all need this hope. He goes on to add to this amazing message in verse 39. The promise. Now what promise is he talking about? What did he just tell us? The promise is forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the promise. So he says, this promise that I just revealed to you, the promise is for you. He's talking to the crowd there. That crowd that had gathered on the day of Pentecost is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Hallelujah. That means me. That means you. That means my children, my grandchildren. As long as the Lord delays his coming for every generation that comes after them, this is a promise that is made for all time, for all people everywhere. This is the promise that brings hope to the world. It says in verse 40 and 41 
with many other words, we got some other, uh, more of his message in there. But in verse 40 and 41, it says, with many other words, he warned them. He pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. It says in verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. The doors to the kingdom of God were opened up through Jesus and the promise that was made. And on that one day, 3,000 responded and entered into the kingdom of God. As a, result of, as a result of listening and believing and responding to the message of hope. So today what I want us to do is break down the steps of how people come to have the benefit of the promise of the hope that we find in this promise that he made that day. And to understand that this is a fulfillment of God's promise. Do you know when this promise was first revealed this is this is if, if you want to look at bible history i love this you remember when adam and eve sinned in the garden and and god speaks to them and he says here's the curse of sin now here's all that's going to happen but here's one thing he told them he said one who is coming who will crush the serpent's head the serpent was satan and the one who is coming is the one peter's talking about in acts chapter 2 the hope in jesus Jesus crushes Satan with his death, burial, and resurrection. You see, the hope was, was beginning to be revealed as soon as the sin entered the world. God was right there giving us the hope of the deliverance that he was going to bring through Jesus. So let's look at this process that the people went through who were now able to claim this hope. When, when you talk about this, here's what I want you to do. If there's anybody here today that's here without really feeling fully assured that you have hope of salvation in Christ, I want you to know how can you leave here today with that hope. But here's something else. There are many of you here today who already know that hope and you're secure in that hope. I want you to know how to lead somebody else to know that hope too. If someone were to come to you with that question, what can I do? I know I've sinned. I'm convicted. I, I know I've messed up. Is there any hope? I want you to be able to answer them. Take them through the process of what they need to do. Now, if any of you here have recently been through Lakeshore 101 and you paid attention, you'll know this series. You'll know what we're talking about today. You'll know these steps already. If you haven't been through 101, I would encourage you. I've got another one in January. I'd encourage you to sign up for that and, uh, and attend that class. But let's look at the step. The first step here, number one on your outline, the first step of faith. We know that the scripture reveals this. You're saved by grace through faith. Okay? So we know faith is essential for salvation. Uh, the most well-known verse in all of the Bible, John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life, right? You, you want to know that verse? You know that he's talking about believing in Jesus. So we know that salvation begins with and ends with believing in Jesus. We have to believe what the Bible says about Jesus. We have to believe in his coming as God in the flesh. We have to believe in the story that Peter was causing them to remember that day. That, that we and our sins nailed him to the cross, but God raised him from the dead and has made him now both Lord and Christ. We have to believe that about Jesus or we cannot be saved. That's the first step. If somebody wants to know. How could I have any hope in the face of my sin and my failure? It begins and ends with believing in Jesus. But here's the problem. In the church today, we have cheapened what the Bible says it means to believe in Jesus. We have so watered it down and so made it less than what the Bible says it is. And that's why at churches all over America and in other parts of the world today, you will hear preachers say, just believe, just let Jesus into your heart and you'll be saved. And there's some truth to that if they actually taught what it means to believe in Jesus. But, but many times they don't. They don't call for anything more than just pray this prayer and let Jesus in your heart. And that means now you're saved. That's all they tell people to do. And that's how they tell them it means to believe in Jesus. Just do that. But that's not what the Bible says about what it means to put your faith in Jesus. The Bible says so much more than that. If you go to the book of James... Uh, we're going to look at a passage in James chapter 2. 
James is a very practical book. That's why I love James. It's so practical to the point. Uh, you don't have much confusion about what James is saying. He's, he's really clear and forthright, okay? And, and by the time James writes his letter, this is James, the half-brother of Jesus, who came to be a believer and a follower of Jesus. And I say half-brother because uh, they didn't have the same dad. So, <laughs> right? And, 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 and James... James is writing at a time where already, remember the saying I have here at Lakeshore, given enough time and opportunity, what can we do? We can mess it up. Already the church is messing up this teaching about faith and belief and what it means to have faith. And so James wants to say once and for all, clearly, here's what it means to have faith. Here's what saving faith is. So he's going to define it for us so we don't have to wonder, we don't have to ask any questions, we don't have to debate over this. If we let the Bible be our authority, the Bible tells us clearly what it means to have faith, saving faith. So here's what he says in verse 20 to 24. You foolish person, do you, not, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made, what's that word? Complete by what he, what's that word? Did. Oh, wait a minute. He says, faith, biblical faith, is useless. Uh, faith without what he's talking about here, biblical faith, is useless. Biblical faith is the only kind of faith that will bring you the response, the results that you want of salvation. And biblical faith is believing and actions working together, and that's what makes faith complete. That's what makes it whole. That's what makes it effective. So here's what he says in verse 23. The scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. Verse 24, the faith-only churches never preach on this one. Verse 24 says this, you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Whoa. Just believe. Yes, if it's the kind of belief that produces the action that God is calling for, then yes, you're saved just by believing. But it's got to be faith that produces the action that God calls for. People like to leave out that part because it actually demands something from us, doesn't it? It actually demands a response, an obedient response from us. And people don't want that accountability. They don't want to have to be held accountable to respond to God the way God is calling on us to respond to Him. We want to keep living any way we want to live and just believing. Well, that's not believing, scripturally speaking. If you still are choosing your sin, if you're still are choosing disobedience, willfully choosing disobedience, then you don't believe the way the Bible says to believe to be saved. Saving faith produces the right action. Well, what is the action that's called for? Well, the first step is to believe. Well, listen, to, let's go back to Acts chapter 2. Peter preaches a sermon. They say, what shall we do? What do we need to do about this? Is there any hope? Is there anything we could do to, to make things right with God? And Peter says, just believe. Is that what he said? No. What did he say? Repent and be baptized. Why didn't he start with faith? Why didn't he say, well, first you have to believe in order to be saved? We know why, if you think about it. If you look at the circumstances, if you look at what's going on here, they already Peter already knows they believe the message that he just preached. How does he know that? Because they never would have asked, what do we need to do if they had not believed the message? You get that? See, when somebody asks for directions, which people don't do much anymore thanks to GPS and all that, but, but if, you know, occasionally I have as a man, even one, I think maybe twice <laughs> in my life, I have stopped and asked for directions. And sometimes we'll still get a phone call here at the church and people will say, can you give me directions to the church? Now, what's the first thing I'm going to ask them? Where are you starting from? See, Peter's answer to their question is starting where they already are now. They already believe what Peter said, so now he's telling them, here are the next things you need to do based on where you are now. Where you are now is you're convicted of sin. You believe the message, and that's why you feel convicted of sin. And now I'm going to tell you what you need to do to claim this hope 
that God offers through Jesus. Which leads us to number two, and that is the process of repentance. Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. There are so many great illustrations of repentance, but there are so many churches in our country today and around the world that never call people to repentance. They're only calling people to believe. But when you look at the Scripture, repentance is always connected to forgiveness of sins. Always. Now, we can't have the hope without forgiveness of sins, and we can't have forgiveness of sins without repentance. Why wouldn't the church be calling people to repentance? See, people are choosing to go on willfully disobeying God and sinning, and the church is telling people, just believe and you'll be saved. They're not calling them to repent. The word repent means to turn around and go a different direction. That's what the word means. The root of the word repent means to change your mind about things, to change the way you think about things. You see, before you're convicted of sin, you're thinking your sin is okay. You're welcoming sin into your life as if, if it's, your friend. It's where you find your fun. It's where you, what you pursue. It's what you go after. But after you're convicted of sin, what happens is, as you think differently about sin now, you don't want to welcome sin into your life anymore. Now you want to turn away from sin and toward, turn toward what is the right thing to do according to God. Repentance is that process of turning. When I talk to children uh, in children's church and things like that, and I talk to younger crowds about repentance, I often say it like this. It's like you're walking down the road and all of a sudden, it's like a light comes on. Ding, 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 ding. Uh-oh, I'm going the wrong way. And if I keep going this way, I'm going to be lost. So I don't want to keep going the wrong way. At repentance would be, all right, I'm not choosing that way anymore. I'm going to stop. I'm going to turn around. I'm going to find the right way. And I'm going to start going the right way. That's repentance. And too few churches are actually boldly calling on people to turn from their sins. We're so much in a tolerant society that the church has bought into it so much that churches are afraid to tell people the way you're going is wrong. It's sinful. It will lead to your destruction. You need to turn around. Now, here's the key. The only reason you tell them that is because you love them. You love them so much, you don't want to see them going the wrong way, going to their destruction. You love them too much to let them keep doing that. That's why you're willing to boldly say to them, I love you, and you are you're living outside the will of God. You need to turn around and start going the right way. You need to repent. Because according to Scripture, there is no forgiveness of sins without repentance. Repentance is a step that's absolutely essential for our sins to be forgiven. I love the story of the lost son or the prodigal son that Jesus told in Luke 15. Remember this young son went off, he, he left his father's house and he went off and he took his father's money and he spent it with wild lifestyle, living a sinful life. And then he ran out of money and a famine hit the land where he was and he didn't have any help. He got a job feeding pigs, which is a young Jewish boy feeding pigs is not the job opportunity he was looking for. And, and I love in Luke 15 in this story in verse 17, there's a key verse. Here's what it says. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. That's the beginning of repentance. When he came to his senses, he started thinking differently about his sin. He realized he was worse off away from the father. He was better off under the covering of the father. And he wanted to make things right with his father. That's the beginning of repentance. To change the way you think about your sin. You can't welcome sin into your life anymore as if it's okay. Now, it doesn't mean Christians never mess up anymore, that they never sin anymore. That's not what this means. It means that we think differently about sin. We don't welcome sin anymore. We don't act like it's okay anymore. And we work hard to turn from it and go the right way when we see it come into our lives. We're never told, just believe. And your sins don't matter anywhere in Scripture. We're told to turn from our sins. So that we could be forgiven. Well then there's this third step. Peter said repent and do what else? What did he say? Repent and verse 38. Be baptized. That's number three on your outline. The obedience of baptism. Repent and be baptized every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And we're going to set up a baptism class. And at the end of the quarter we'll have a baptism service. And, and then we'll, we'll start baptizing people after you complete the course. Is that what he said? 
But isn't that what so many churches are doing? Baptism becomes an afterthought after you do all this other stuff. You got saved today. Now, later on when you're ready, you're going to get baptized. Peter didn't separate these two things, did he? See, when he said repent and be baptized, the word there in the Greek and, uh, it, it is joining those two things together. He's saying do these two things so that you can receive the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. The two things were repentance and baptism. So they already believe, and he's still telling them, you need to repent. And he's still telling them, even when you repent, what else do you need to do? Be baptized. All of those things are the proper response to the gospel of Jesus Christ when you realize you're convicted of sin and you want your sins to be forgiven. Now remember, this is the first time the gospel has ever been preached. This is the first time that question has ever been asked and answered in Scripture. And notice what he says. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. So how many of them needed to do it? All of them. Now, here's what you need to know. There wasn't a single baby baptized that day because they could not do what? Repent. That's why we don't baptize babies at Lakeshore. They can't get to this place where they're convicted of sin and know they need to repent. In fact, they don't need to repent because according to the scriptures, the kingdom of heaven is made up of little ones like this. Okay? It's only when we willfully choose to be disobedient to God that we need to repent. That's what sin is. Until you get to that age, you don't have guilt of sin yet. But when you get to an age where you understand you've done that, that's when you need to be called to believe and to repent and to be baptized. Repent and be baptized, he says, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then he went on to say, remember, this promise is for you. And who else? Your children. Good, you're paying attention. Your children. And who else? For all who are far off, for as many, whoever the Lord will call, right? So, when somebody today wants to know, what do I need to do? How can I make things right with God? What should we tell them? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Why would we change that? That's where the promise is. That's where the hope is. Why would we take anything away from it? Why would we add anything to it? We don't have the power to do that. He says, repent and be baptized in the name of whom? Jesus Christ. In the name of means by the authority of. I hope this has never happened to you, but you might have been arrested in the name of the law, right? Okay, in the name of the law means by the authority of the law, right? In the name of Jesus Christ means by the authority of Jesus Christ. Now, who has the authority to forgive sins? Jesus, not this church, not some denomination, not some preacher somewhere. Who has the power to forgive sins? Jesus. So who can tell us the process that we need to be uh, obedient to for our sins to be forgiven? Who has the authority to do that? Jesus. Who has the authority to change that? And Jesus hasn't changed it anywhere in Scripture. So, when people are asking today, coming to the church, seeking hope, they need to be told what Peter said here. Because it's by the authority of Jesus Christ that Peter gives them this answer. It's by the authority of Jesus Christ that sins are forgiven. It's by the authority of Jesus Christ that I preach here at Lakeshore and that any other teacher here at Lakeshore teaches the gospel here. It is His authority that gives us the opportunity to have the hope we find in Christ. And yet so many churches want to leave out baptism as part of this process. As if it's not connected in any way to this promise and this hope. There's a passage in 1 Peter 3 and verse 21 where Peter says this. He's talking about Noah and the flood and how he and his family were saved through the water. And then he says, this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Oh, wait a minute. What does he say baptism does? Saves you. Wow. All these churches not baptizing people till later on, telling them they already got saved. But what does the scripture say? Baptism now saves you. Now, I know the argument. I understand. You're saying ducking somebody in the water saves them. That's a work. You can't work for your salvation. That's not what we're saying. If I believed that just dunking somebody in the water would save them, if you've been on 101, you know I would do this, okay? We would start a whole new ministry team. I would get a flatbed truck, and I'd put a big water tank on the back, and I'd get 
the biggest, strongest people we've got at Lakeshore. And we would drive around the community and just stop people on the street and say, have you been baptized yet? And if they said no, I'd get those guys to jump out and grab them and dunk them in the water. (laughs) We would have a drive-by baptism ministry team. If that's all we had to do to save people is dunk them in the water, man, I would do drive-by baptisms all day, every day. Because my heart is for people to be saved. But remember, Peter is working with people who already believe, and he's already commanded them they have to repent, and then the next step is to be baptized. Without belief and repentance, baptism just gets people wet. That's all it does. But when it's followed, following believing and repenting of sin, it is the step of obedience. I love this wording in 1 Peter. It says it's a pledge of a clear conscience toward God. And in the original language, what is literally used as in that phrase, oftentimes is signing your name on an agreement saying that you accept the offer being made. That's what baptism is before God. It's saying, okay, God, I surrender to you. I accept your offer. I'm going to sign my name to the agreement. Signing your name to the agreement doesn't earn the benefits of the agreement, it says that you accept the offer in the agreement. So baptism is not a work that earns anybody's salvation. It is an acceptance of the work that God has already done on the cross. Notice he says it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ in that passage. The water is not what saves you. What Jesus Christ did on the cross is what saves you. But the way you accept that and receive that is by being baptized as you repent of your sins. So this promise is for everyone. Well, that leads us to number four. We got people baptized. All right, we got people baptized here at Lakeshore. People get baptized every week here. We had another baptism last week. It was great. We love celebrating baptisms. We love doing that. So then we're done, right? We got them baptized. So now they're saved and we're finished. That's it, right? No, that's not it. Remember the Great Commission in Matthew 28? He says, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then there's a whole other step there. He says, then teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. You see, baptizing them into Christ is supposed to lead to another step. And that's the fourth thing on your outline here. That's the lifestyle of discipleship. Look at verse 41. Remember that one? Those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. So, okay, Peter preaches the message. He opens up the door to the kingdom. People respond obediently. They repent, and 3,000 of them are baptized that day. They're welcomed into the kingdom. So what happens next? Well, there's a next verse there, verse 42. It's kind of a summary verse of what those people did for the rest of their lives. And it says they devoted themselves to four things for the rest of their lives. And that's the lifestyle of discipleship. Remember, he told us to go and make what? disciples not believers to go and make what disciples well disciples are devoted to four things at least disciples of Jesus in the Bible were devoted to four things let's look at verse 42 they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching to the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer you see when we baptize someone into Christ they are then new creatures They are, it says, another term used in Scripture is sometimes, it's it's an analogy of being born again. You heard of that, right? It's like they're born to a new life in Christ. They rise up out of that pool of baptism and they're new babes in Christ now. Well, what do you do with babies? Set them out on the doorstep and say, have a good life. No, that's not God's plan for babies, is it? God's plan for babies is that that they're born into a family, and in that family, they grow up, and they're taught, and they learn, and they get stronger, and they get more mature, and they end up being able to stand on their own feet and do, do things to help others then. All right, so there's a process they're supposed to go through. Well, when we make disciples, there's a process that they're supposed to go through, and it happens through the local church. That's the family for the new babies that come into Christ It's the local church family. That's why these Christians that say, I love Jesus, but I don't want anything to do with the church, are totally missing out on Christianity and discipleship. They're not disciples if they're not connected to a local church. They've removed themselves from the process of discipleship if they're not part of the local church. It's in the local church, that's the family where discipleship takes place. So you can't be disconnected from the local church and be a disciple, according to Scripture. So, The discipleship process included four things that they devoted themselves to. One was the apostles' teaching. 
Here's the cool thing. They could sit and listen to the apostles themselves. They had the apostles right there. And they were devoted to listening to the teachings of the apostles. Now, we don't have the apostles today, but here's what we do have. We have the written word preserved for us, where their teaching is recorded for us. So if we're going to be devoted to the apostles' teaching in the church today, that's why Lakeshore is a teaching church. We teach the Bible here because that's what it means to be devoted to the apostles' teaching. And you need to be devoted to that. Once you get baptized into Christ, your life should be devoted to studying God's Word. Learning what the Bible says. And we offer all kinds of opportunities for you to do that through the church family here. Now, you need to take responsibility for that. The church cannot do this for you. We can't make you sign up for a class. We can't make you participate in a small group. We can't make you attend the services on Sunday. I do a teaching style of preaching on purpose on Sundays because our job is to teach, to continue teaching. That's what God's called us to do in discipleship. You need to bring yourself under the teaching of God's word. But nobody can make you do that. More and more in the church in America today, the average Christian is attending maybe two times a month on average. Attending church or a Bible study. Maybe two times a month. We're off to ball games. We're off to vacations. We're off to, to all this other stuff, family activities. We've got all this other stuff that gets in the way. So, so we can only work in a, a one or two times a month, you know, to actually come under the teaching of God's Word. Can't do much discipleship that way. Can't grow up like you need to, mature like you need to. You're not going to be equipped like you need to be equipped to face the challenges that you face in the world that way. God has a plan here. And that is for you to be devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the teaching of God's Word. They were devoted not only to the apostles' teaching, but also, it says, to fellowship. That word fellowship, the root of that word means to share. You know what they were devoted to? Their brothers and sisters in Christ. They were devoted to each other in the church. And you're not devoted to each other in the church if you so easily, readily skip and don't attend. That's why there's a warning in the book of Hebrews. He says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. That's going to be an important part of your life as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Don't let that slide. Don't take that lightly. Make sure you show up for each other and support each other and hold each other accountable in the body of Christ. We all need that because this world will beat us down and drag us away. It really will. I don't care how strong you are today. If you disconnect from the fellowship, it won't be long before you're not that strong anymore and Satan will take you away. So we need to be devoted to the fellowship. It also means to share physically, uh, emotionally, uh, in teaching. It means to share financially. It means to share in every way, to love each other and take care of each other. You know what they said about the early church, the thing that impressed people about the early church more than anything else? They said, my, how they love one another. That's what impressed them about the early church. That's what drew people to the church. As they looked at the church and they saw a group of people, a family that loved each other, that sacrificed for each other, that took care of each other, that held each other accountable. You can't do that if you take being a part of the fellowship lightly and you don't really commit to it. You're not really devoted to it. You have to be devoted to it to have that in your life and to give that to others. They were devoted then to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread. And most scholars believe, and I agree, that the breaking of bread is referring to what we just did here today, and we do it every Lord's Day at every service. It's what we call communion or the Lord's Supper. See, they were devoted to doing that regularly, and I believe that is so important in the life of the Christian because at the root of everything as a Christian, as a disciple, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And coming around this table is that reminder we need to have of the love of God and the sacrifice that he's made for us on the cross. Because if we don't come back to this regularly like we need to, we lose that heart for Jesus that we need to have. And we forget how much God loves us when we're not around this table like we need to be. And that's why here at Lakeshore we're going to do this every week to remind us we're devoted to the breaking of bread. And then he says they're devoted to prayer as our praise team gets ready. They're devoted to prayer. As we've done this Bringing Hope initiative, we have bathed it in prayer. But we do that all the time at Lakeshore with everything we do. And we need to learn individually, not just corporately as a church, what a vital step it is in our lives. If we're going to follow Jesus, is to be really devoted in our prayer lives. 
Because prayer is what connects you to the power that allows you to live the life God has called you to live. It is through the prayer and the study of the Word of God that you are totally connected to God. You maintain that relationship with God on that personal level that it needs to be on so that you are strengthened and equipped and provided for so you can walk daily in a way that brings glory and honor to the God who sacrificed everything for you. Maybe you're here today and you've never you've never responded to the gospel in these steps. Well, you could take care of that today. You could come today believing. You could come repenting, turning from sin. You could come today if you've not been obedient in baptism. We'll take care of that today. We've got the water ready. We've got the robes. We've got the towels. We've got everything. You don't need to have anything today except you willing to come. And we'll take care of the rest. But today it may be that you need to commit to be devoted, more devoted in your life to studying God's Word, to coming around the Lord's table regularly. Be more devoted to the fellowship. Connect to a local church and commit to that local church and give to it and support it like you need to. And devote yourself to prayer. Make that who you are every day. You are a prayer. That's what you do. That's who you are as a follower of Jesus. Whatever the steps are you need to take today, we're going to stand and sing and invite you to come. For the rest of us, maybe, maybe today we can be better equipped to go out and lead some others who need to know about the hope we have found in Jesus. Lead them through this process. You are our greatest outreach. You can bring the hope of Jesus to people that may not be here on a Sunday until you, God uses you to bring them into this process. As we stand and sing now, we invite you to come.